it's not what goes in to you that is going to uh, change you or defile you. It's what you do with what goes into you. So you can take something that's poisonous and filled with tamas, etc., and that you can transform it into sattva. Welcome to Living with Reality, a podcast featuring archive teachings and modern conversations with Dr. Robert Svoboda, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Living with Reality explores Ayurveda and other wisdom traditions of India, which Dr. Svoboda has been studying for nearly 50 years. For more information, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dr. Svoboda. That's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A. Hello, and welcome to Living with Reality. I'm Paula Crossfield, your host and Dr. Swoboda's business collaborator. Today, I have a very special episode for you featuring a conversation with Dr. Frederick Smith about Vemalananda, who so many of you have grown to know and love through Dr. Robert Svoboda's Agora books. This conversation uh, is important because Fred Smith is one of the people who Dr. Robert Svoboda sat with uh, in Vimalananda's presence, who knew Vimalananda for many years. Um, And so having a conversation with uh, Dr. Smith would be the perfect kind of conversation to get you to understand what it was like to be in his presence. And it is particularly notable because this month of December, uh, we're in 2023, this is the 40 year anniversary of Vimalananda's death. So it is the perfect time to revisit some of these stories. And I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Smith, who is a former professor at the University of Iowa. And he is particularly trained in the study of Sanskrit literature. He lived in India for 16 years, and he's written a book called The Self-Possessed, which is a study of possession um, in India, which I highly recommend. And I know that Dr. Sabota also highly recommends um, if you're interested in the topic of possession. Um, So Dr. Smith has a long history with India and continues to visit there a lot. And I think you'll enjoy these stories. I act as a sort of moderator here, but I will tell you that was only because the two of them didn't know where to start and they asked me to do that. But um, I hope that what I have to ask helps facilitate the conversation in a good way and that you take away some good gems from this conversation. And of course, as always, if you want to learn with Dr. Robert. He has many courses on various topics from Tantra to Ayurveda to Jyotisha to the different deities um, like Ganesha and Hanuman and different practices you can use to work with these deities. All of that is available at Dr. Svoboda, D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A dot teachable dot com. You go to the products or courses up in the right hand corner open it up and you'll see everything that is currently available for sale. And you can go in there and and learn more from him. Okay. So without further ado, here is this week's episode of the podcast. Hello, Dr. Fred Smith and Dr. Svoboda. Welcome. We're going to talk a little bit today about your first encounters with Vimalananda, your experience with Vimalananda. So maybe we can start there with how you first uh, met Vimalananda and how Fred first met Vimalananda? Um, well, let me start with how I first met Fred, which was in Pune. I had just got there to uh, be enrolled and study at the Ayurveda College, and Fred was uh, doing his master's degree in Sanskrit at Deccan College in Pune. And we were introduced um, by our friend Nandu Kumar Gujar, who eventually became Swami Gopalananda. Uh, and um, uh, it was after we were introduced by him that um, 
we started uh, hanging out together. Yes, I also know that the person who taught philosophy at, at Pune University, who taught a class I was taking named Dr. Bhavisad, lived next door to Robert. And was the Sanskrit teacher at the, um, at the Ayurved College. Yes. So, so there, were, there were connections, connections. there. And I met Vimalananda in September of 75, and you met him? In maybe December of 79. December of 79, and I introduced um, Fred to him. Fred had gone back to the U.S. and then came back to India. Right. So what, what first impressed you? I know you've talked a little bit about this, Dr. Robert, but maybe, Fred, you can share a little bit about what your first experience was like with Vimalananda, and you can share whatever in, insight you want to, too. Shall I speak? Please. Uh, well, when I was taken to Sri Vimalananda, and I had, in the interim, Ravi had come back to the U.S., and his parents were living in Farmington, New Mexico, uh, which is not terribly far by New Mexico standards, to Santa Fe. and uh, we Which had, is your birthplace. Which place, is my native place. Your hometown. And, uh, my hometown. And... Um, we had gone up to the Rio Grande Gorge, uh, just south of Taos, and we're sitting there, and he was telling me a lot about Vimalananda, which is, and that gorge is a very amazing and sacred place by itself. And um, I thought, you know what, I need to meet Vimalananda. So when I got back to Pune uh, towards the end of 1979, uh, one of the first things we did was meet uh, Sri Vimalananda, and my first meeting with him was at his apartment, at his abode. And um, uh, we came in, and uh, in this kind of dark corridor uh, by the gate guardian, which was this kind of dissolute-looking, young, youngish Parsi guy with a T-shirt and a pair of shorts. And I thought... This is this is pretty nice. It's it looks like um, an old Mughal court or something like that. <laughs> and so we were ushered into the room, uh, and Roshni was there, and Robbie, and and uh, there were these two small chairs, um, comfortable but small, just about a foot off the floor, and. Um, he was sitting in one, Vimalananda was, and there was this small Pekingese named Lizu sitting next to him. And um, I thought, wow, this is great. It's so informal. And um, informal, but he was a very commanding looking presence. His uh, hair was always very neatly done, combed straight back. And his um, uh, he had, as I recall, a purple regular Western style shirt on and um, uh, patterned and um, uh, there was a, a drink in his hand, a dog by his feet. And I thought this is, this is really different from any kind of, you know, spiritual sort of presence that I've been introduced to in India because of course my background was quite, um, mainstream, you know, where people would try to fit the expectations of Western clientele and so on, but there was none of that. So I was immediately relaxed and we would sit on the floor and, you know, a few people would file in here and there. And there might have been a half a dozen people there after a while. And Vimalananda was um, taking questions. He was intermittently smoking, um, petting his dog. The dog would be in the lap sometimes. And um, we had a very nice chat and introduced ourselves. I introduced myself and and Kathy, and uh, we we did we did good. It was a nice, memorable, relaxed occasion. And I thought, well, spirituality can come in all kinds of different sizes and shapes. And let's see how this goes. So was it like a satsang where you're asking spiritual questions? Oh, it could have been a bit of a satsang. There were people who were always asking him questions. But many of them would ask questions more about, is my 
truck yes. going to be able to make it up the hill with the over now that it's overloaded? Please help me out, kind of thing. Exactly. This is the kind of question that most people want to know. People go to somebody with a spiritual reputation, and a person is expected to be a siddha of some kind or another. And in this case, they were right. And a siddha means somebody who had, who was able to um, to say and do things that were unusually prescient, let's say. And people were asking questions like that. They always they always come to these people. I want to know, you know, what can is my grandmother going to survive? Is my daughter going to find a good match? Is my son? I haven't heard from him for a year. He's been in in North India, and how is he doing? This kind of thing. This is what people want to know. And there's nothing wrong with that. And um, because they're not asking spiritual questions about the nature of the self, is should not be considered to be a non-spiritual question. No, Vimal Ananda was always happy when people would ask spiritual questions, because otherwise it was always the same kind of run-of-the-mill thing. Yeah. So what did you witness there that made you want to return or that intrigued you besides the environment? Like, what was it about his energy or was there something that he said to you or was there a connection forged? Well, there were two things. One is I had been already good friends with Dr. Robbie here. And the second thing was his eyes. Okay. His eyes were such as I had not seen before. And um, I couldn't quite tell what the color was in that evening light, Bombay light, in a room that never gets direct sunlight. And um, it, uh, I couldn't tell if they were blue or gray or, or green or what. And um, he was very expressive, his face, his demeanor, his body language, he was the most Beautifully expressive person, maybe that I, I had ever met in that way. His big shoulders, his nice, smooth arms. I, you know, he must have been getting towards the end of his life, about four, four or five years before he died, four years before. And um, he, uh, he was a person whose who's very every movement was significant. And I began to learn then that uh, from the very first meeting, that in order for me to understand what was going on with him, I had to really pay attention. Because he was working on, and I was hardly familiar with working on different levels at once, but I could see immediately that he was doing things on levels in addition to simply addressing our needs and questions. And I thought, okay, I want to find out. I, I, I'm, I want to dig deep, more deeply into this. You the know, thing but, about his eye color, of course, is that um, it changed. And more than once, we would be, he and I would be together with some other people, and he would say, he would just adjust his eye color so that it, his and mine were the same. And sometimes he would adjust it to be the same as somebody else's eye color. That was quite, I've never seen that before. What, what was the point of that, though? Was that to kind of connect with the person or engage in a certain way? Or what do you think the point was? I think part of it was to have fun and connect with the person. He was always doing things to have fun, just to an experiment, see what would happen. But I also suspect that that, that alters somehow the, the, your perceptorium when, when, you know, as, uh, and that may have just been a sign of how he was aligning in some other way with that person. But yeah. he, never t he never talked about what he was doing. I mean, most of what he did, he never talked about. He yeah. talked about a lot, but I mean, that was still not the majority of what was going on. In this way, he's very learned. He was one of the most learned people that, that one would meet. And in India, there's a lot of really learned people walking around whom you could meet. And of course, you know, we did meet such people, but he was very learned in a lot of sort of academic and history and in philosophy and in spirituality and a lot of ways that we that, that I would connect with given where I was at the time and remember that was 40 45 years ago or 40 something like that 43 44 years ago and um, uh, 
But then he would, I would see flashes of him saying things and doing things that I, that I knew that I didn't know what he was doing. And, um, but he was, uh, you know, beautiful to, to listen to and to watch. And, uh, you know, I had to drop pretensions, spiritual pretensions that we all had when we were young about, uh, about, say, smoking or other sorts of things that we were like, letting. you're not allowed to do those things. You yeah, have to like be you're not allowed to do these things. Yes. I mean, and, and um, what was his perspective, just to put a finer point on it? Well, I mean, his perspective was it's not, uh, and I think it, 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 it's not what goes into you that is going to uh, change you or defile you. It's what you do with what goes into you. So you can take something that's poisonous and filled with tamas, et cetera, and it, you can transform it into sattva. I mean, he would say, for example, uh, and this was back at a time when uh, even in Bombay, many people were still cooking things on coal. And coal is very black and very dirty. And uh, it takes a long time to get the coal started. Once it gets started, it, it is hard to put it out. So uh, he would say, you know, tamas is like this coal. It's it's going to remain, it's going to pollute you, it's going to pollute things around you until you ignite it. And it's going to take a lot of, the more tummus you have, the more effort it's, I'm paraphrasing here, the more effort it's going to take to ignite it. But once it's ignited, that tummus is going to keep it burning. So if you are, if, if this is the direction in which you are supposed to go according to your own personal dharma, and you work hard, then it will give you, um, it, it can give you a lot more momentum than if you're just doing very, uh, very mild and, 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 and sattvic and, uh, and, and conventional uh, spiritual practices. We always watched what he was doing. For example, he would take us sometimes in Pune. He was in Pune for about four months of the year because the the horse racing season for Bombay was in Pune and during the, the rainy season, hot season, rainy season. And um, he would take us sometimes to a dinner place called the Hotel Dreamland. And the Dreamland was this very refined Gujarati tali that was endless. <laughs> and they would serve you until you, until you, you rolled out, you rolled out the yes. door. <laughs> Or were carted out. <laughs> or were carted out. And um, everything there was extremely fine, extremely beautiful, extremely well done. And, um, and Vimond would uh, encourage us to eat our fill, but you could see his eyes kind of narrowing when it got to certain dishes. And uh, <laughs> I thought, what's that about? <laughs> and so I felt mm, he would be looking at this dish. And I thought, okay, I better not eat that. But on the whole, he was a person of very refined taste and knew where to get things that were very refined. But he knew what the limits were, mm. um, even in a place like that. Um, but, of course, Robert has been in plenty more of those places with him. Maybe you can talk about some of the experiences that you've had, like shared experiences, stories, talk about, you know, different situations you got yourself into and how you saw Vimalananda navigate. You want to start, Robert? Um, well, I, I think the thing to emphasize is that both of us, me particularly because I was his authorized racing agent, but... Um, you know, both of us have experienced him in situations in which he made it a point not to let anyone know what his capabilities were. So just right. being out in the world at the race course or, or at the Dreamland Hotel or traveling around or, or whatever. It was so it was always very instructive to watch how he was managing a situation, knowing that there was so much more 
to him than what he was displaying and to mm -hmm. see how that situation was being managed. And, you know, if, if he really lost his temper, then unusual things would happen. Uh, that like what? Well, we were talking earlier. Uh, I wasn't there that time, but uh, uh, Fred was with him when they went to, there's this very unusual temple outside Pune, uh, near the near the city of Yevat called Buleshwar. It was a fortified tantric monastery. And it's it's unusual in many ways. But we used to go there and I used to go there and do a certain thing to find out whether one of his horses would win or not. He Which is in there. Agora 3, Which for is people Agora who are 3. listening. And um, so there, once uh, Fred had gone there with Dr. Banotra, who was a, a, a Ayurvedic, kind of Ayurvedic doctor from Bombay. I'm a very prominent and affluent doctor, but please. Yes, so Dr. Panotra and I went there with Vimalananda in, and um, uh, always a trip to Buleshwar was, was really worth it. It's about 35 kilometers from Pune, southeast of Pune, uh, towards Sholapur, which means towards Hyderabad, that direction. And uh, um, it's up on a mountain, or a big hill. Um, it's very prominent. Um, you can see from the road several kilometers away that there's a temple up there, but almost nobody would go up there because it was really prominent in maybe the 500 years ago. It's really an old temple. And um, with all of this incredible imagery, both with like, a lot of reliefs from Mahabharata, from Ramayana, from from uh, tantric sources. All of these, I mean, it's it's one of a kind in that whole area. Um, and it was a very powerful place. And Vimalananda had the capacity to kind of enliven the the tantric forces at that place to go in there with him. And by the time I knew him, he was already pushing up there in years. And for him to even walk up there from the parking was a little bit of an effort. And uh, Dr. Panotra, um, I mean, unbelievably, it was, it was, Dr. Panotra actually ran out of gas, mm -hmm. something which absolutely he should not have done. And uh, the late Vimalananda was not happy about this. And um, uh, because there we were stranded on top of this place, you know, 30, 35 kilometers from Pune. And, um, and back then there was nothing there. There's more yeah. stuff around it now. So there you were, no one was around. There's nothing there. What are we going to do? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Vimalananda, he, uh, he reminded us of the story of a certain tantric whom he'd met who could piss into the gas, ta gas tank and the car would go for another 100 kilometers. And um, uh, we thought, is he going to do that now? <laughs> 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 and he did not. But he beat on the gas tank a few times, on the, you know, or fill it up. Just He was pissed off. He beat on it a few times. With his it, fist? With his fist. And it got us back to Pune. Oh, well, there you and, go. <laughs> um, or at least to the next petrol pump, which is close to Pune. So, um, but he let Dr. Bonotra know exactly um, how the, he felt. The species of four legged animal that he uh, had descended from. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So you're saying but he had a temper he and had he a wasn't temper. afraid to show it also. He was, he was not at all not at afraid all. to show his temper. No, it's not like he was sitting on some dais and Hari Om Mataji kind of thing. No. Right. Well, he said he wasn't a guru for, I don't know, for that he reason. Never would, he never said he was a guru. He always said he wanted to learn more and more. And, uh, but I, you know, at, at least a couple of other times, I remember that we were out in the car and, something went wrong with the car and he said, let's, you know, once he said, you better pray to Hanuman now because otherwise we're not gonna get back. So we prayed to Hanuman and the car went back, you know, so. <laughs> um, I, I actually remember 
uh, another inst- incident that involved Dr. Banotra. You know, the thing with him was he was interested in dealing with his Renano Bandanas, his yes. karmic debts. And that meant even if there were useless people hanging around, he would let them hang around as long as he felt that there was some karmic debt there. As soon as, as he felt like that was finished, he would kick them out or they would automatically not return or something else would happen. So he, he, he found Dr. Banotra vaguely amusing. And you're saying Vimalananda was most found, concerned with that, so yes. he would let people hang around. Yes. yes. Okay. So Vimalananda found Dr. Banotra modestly amusing, and he did make some in, some decent medicine. So he would let uh, Banotra hang around because he was delivering the medicine, also. But um, but this also required him to you know to deal with situations that um, where you know he was making sure that because he wanted to continue um, working out his karmas with Dr. Panotra, that he, you know, for example, had to keep him alive. So I, there was, um, there was a, a, often we would go to, uh, uh, on Mahashivaratri, we'd go to some temple somewhere. So one Mahashivaratri, we were all going to a temple of Shiva outside Alandi, which is outside of Pune. And Fred and Vimal and Nanda and somebody else were in one vehicle, and I and Dr. Banotra and his daughter were in another vehicle. And Dr. Banotra was very fond of high-end sweets. And so we had, I don't know, five <laughs> kilos of sweets or something with us. In the back behind, the two of them were sitting in the car, and they were back behind them, you know, so kind of where their heads were next to the the back windshield, and it's a, I'll condense the story, but um, the driver of the car made an unfortunate remark to a group of people who were standing by the side of the road who were upset about an accident that had just happened, and that set these people off, and they decided they were gonna beat us up uh, or kill us, and- um, Which is not unusual in India. It's not overly are unusual, <laughs> but a week, so we were speeding down the road with no windshield left, and. Um, I, I had a few drops of blood from one cut on my ankle. Dr. Banotra and his daughter were covered in blood. Fortunately, they weren't damaged severely because a, a rock, I mean, the size of a watermelon had come through the back windshield, but intersected with all of the sweets and therefore saved them somehow. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I, I then remembered that there was a police station uh, on the road and we went and hid behind the police and uh, and were saved that way. And um, Vimalananda, of course, pretended he didn't know what was going on because he was in the car behind us. But um, it, I always felt like there was some kind of influence happening from him and <clears throat> possibly from much later. In fact, just very recently, I've, I discovered that there is the head of an English soldier who was killed 200 years ago that is being worshipped in that police station. So I always wondered if somehow, because he was always dealing with spirits and and dead things and what have you, if if he just said to that head, you know, okay, make sure that uh, these, that the car in front of us is is properly taken care of and something good will happen to you. Mm -hmm. I don't know that happened, but it just, it was, it was a weird enough as it was, but then to have gone to the one police station, possibly in the whole state of Maharashtra, that has the head of a deceased English soldier in it that's being worshipped, it just seemed a little bit too uh, coincidental to be coincidental. In fact, this brings up the whole topic of spirits, which was a very big subject for Vimalananda, which he imparted a little bit of his vast knowledge to us. And oftentimes he did this in very offhand ways. He wasn't the kind of a person who would sit there and give a lecture. He would answer questions, he liked to tell stories, but he was not a person who would sit there and, and use notes to give an off, an, you know, a philosophical lecture. But we learned a lot about spirits from him. And because that came, became a prominent part of my own like academic research, in which ways I've been involved with spirits as, outside of the academic research, as, as we all have, as I believe we all have, and as I'm sure the Vimalananda 
was perfectly um, aware too. And this is how I got that from him. And maybe, and I'm sure Robbie also, but there's, he was attuned to what we would call the Adidaivika realm, the celestial realm, the, the realm of gods and spirits and, and that kind of thing. You can say there's three realms. There's the Adidaivik, there's the Adibhautik, which is the terrestrial, and the, and the Adhyatmik, that which deals with the self. And almost all spirituality in India is formally uh, adhyatmic, which means deals with meditation and, and that level, especially spirituality, which is designed for non-Indians. Um, but there's a lot in India, as we've both discovered, that is really the adhidaivic level, in the, and he was very attuned to that. He was very attuned to the mechanics of um, of forces around us that are always there, in my view. And I believe I picked up a lot of that from him. And I'm sure that Ravi would, would say the same thing. But uh, to be aware of cosmic forces, whether they were, you could call them deities or call them um, forces or call them whatever you want to call them. But he was, he was always aware that there were other things at work. And one of the places where he... And, you know, he taught us where they existed, were in trees. And um, you can talk about trees. Mm -hmm. I can. Um, you know, he would <laughs> have favorite trees, <clears throat> particularly, uh, I mean, and he would point certain trees out or um, and say that there's something interesting living in that tree and Sometimes he would say, never go too near that tree because the thing that's in it is, is uh, almost like a, you know, a rabid dog. It's, it's, it, you, you can't reason with it at the moment. And um, there was a tree um, outside Pune in the locality uh, uh, called Owned, which is near where the University of Pune is. And uh, Periodically, we would visit some people who lived in Lula Nagar, which right. is near Owned. And when we were coming back into Pune uh, for the night, we would stop at this tree and he would offer it some incense and he would st stand and talk to it for a while and then we'd proceed ahead. And he would never say what he was doing, but he could have been doing anything because, you know, and with regard, sometimes he would ask a tree to benefit somebody. Sometimes he would ask a or whatever was in the tree to keep an eye on somebody. So his, his, he always tried to keep good relations with all of the, uh, the embodied beings and the disembodied beings and tried to get as much collaboration and cooperation as possible. And sometimes this was possible and sometimes it was not possible. And sometimes he had to deal with uh, disembodied things and embodied beings in a severe kind of way. And sometimes he didn't have to. I mean, it was just like there was always this, every situation ended up being in some way original and, and, and uh, non-standard. How do you think he helped the two of you get connected to that, that Adi Daivik realm? Like what, what, how did that transfer for, for you? I think just being around him and, and, and observing and becoming sensitized to the fact that he was doing it, I think sensitized us to it as well. And those, uh, I'm sure there's others who also who were equally sensitized, but we certainly were because we were always aware that he was working on levels that we could not be, about which we could not be fully cognizant, but we could tune in to some extent and through that tuning in, we developed our own, I should say, fairly modest, at least in my case, um, skills at observing such things. And you could observe it not just because of some inner psychic, you know, divya drishti or inner vision, but because of seeing the way that things were on the outside. You could watch things on the outside and understand that there were certain other kinds of intelligences or substantialities or presences that were at work. And then you would think about it and look at things, literally look at things with your eyes in a different way. 
and it's it, it's 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 learned. It's something that could be picked up. I mean, maybe there's some propensity for it, but in any case, it, it is. I mean, this was a way that he was teaching mm. by just sensitizing us to use our own our own senses, really. What role does Homa play? But before I go to that, I'd like to make um, two comments. Number one is, it is really a matter of looking at the same, you know, using your, and not just your physical eye, but, but, but the f- faculty of vision in a more subtle way, but looking at what you normally look at in a conventional way, one that's been, um, you know, evolved over millions and hundreds of millions of years, but looking at things in a slightly different way. Sometimes if I need to do that, um, I have a, a book uh, that, um, I don't even know what they call it now, but it's like <clears throat> two-dimensional flat thing. And if you change the way you look at it, you will see that it appears to be three-dimensional. And that was that's really a similar kind of thing, except not using your physical eye, but you're, you're just kind of readjusting the way you're looking at reality, and then suddenly you can see other things, number one. And number two, um, as Fred was saying, I think um, one thing that um, is characteristic uh, that I found to be true when I'm doing yoga with somebody who is... um, uh, uh, has been uh, has been a, a student and practitioner for a lot longer than me or Ayurveda or Jyotish or any of the other Vidyas, when you're around somebody who has a much more profound relationship to a particular Vidya that you, that you do uh, than you do, and but you have a relation with that Vidya, then during the period you're in that same uh general space as that other person and you're working with them, you will be able to perceive or do things that you can't do on your own otherwise because the Vidya is able to embody herself in you better by virtue of you being in a satsanga with that person who has done much more work than you have. So that's, it's also just the fact that he had done so much more sadhana and he had so much more experience with that world that just being in his presence, just being in satsanga allowed other people to perceive things, even temporarily, that they would never have been able to perceive on their own. And so Ahoma was a practice that he gave you to do. Right? Yes. And so how did that also play in? Well, I mean, uh, uh, Fred here did his... A PhD dissertation on uh, 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 Agnihotra, which is a fancy way of saying uh, uh, the fancy version of Homa in the Vedas. Homa is a general kind of of word. I mean, you you will definitely find people who say they are performing Homa, and other people would say that's not Homa at all. I mean, India is full of different opinions about things, but. His philosophy was um, that uh, the fire is uh, a living being. The fire uh, offers you just as the first uh, the first um, uh, uh, phrase in the Rig Veda says "Agni ile purohitam." So Agni is the purohita is the is the priest. The fire itself is the priest that connects you to the next world, that transmits your offerings to the next world. So if you want to be connected to the next world, having a relationship with fire is really utilitarian because that's the thing that is connecting you to the next world. Yeah, and the whole verb there, ire, agnim ire puravitam, the verb is I adore, I love, I worship. It's all of that's connected up in that unusual Vedic verb. So there was a sense of connection like that. Let me get back to one other point about this. And that's when Dr. Robbie here just mentioned the word vidya and used a pronoun for vidya, she. Connected up with this vidya and with her. Note that. This is a kind of 
exactly the kind of observation that that he ta- that he's been or both of us have been talking about that through observing Vimalananda's relationship with vidyas with what we would simply call branches of knowledge but no but these were these were manifestations these were spirits in a way these were living like a vidya a branch of knowledge is not just a bunch of leafy old books on a floor but these are living beings this is the this is the adidaivic way of seeing it is seeing a, a branch of knowledge a vidya as a living being and how it manifests how it transmutes how it's shaped how it's formed and vimalananda was li- was dropping these breadcrumbs these these clues constantly about that the entire universe was was living and there were living presences and and we might think about abstract entities that might just be uh, nothing it's just just be pieces of floating debris out there but for him they were they were living beings and that was kind of enculturating into us the sense of what of an adidaivic way of seeing the world and there were a lot of things that could that could enhance that including intoxicants including homa uh, and, and any sadhana is there in order to in order to nourish within us the adidaivika perspective that's the way i saw them lananda but you can no, I think that's a very uh, uh, that's a very uh, efficient and detailed way of of looking at that reality. And it really, I mean, it, it, the point is very much that he was always, whether you were aware it, aware of it or not, he was always providing a perspective that he hoped you would pick up on, so that it would broaden your own perspective on reality and. Uh, and and for him, it, literally everything was because I mean, he uh, embraced the Sankhya Darshana as much as m- many other people do. In fact, a lot more. So he would say that everything is because everything is evolved out of consciousness. That everything is conscious. Maybe it's conscious in a tiny. You know, maybe it is not even aware that it is conscious, but there is consciousness in there somewhere. Even it a is, rock. Even a rock, even yes. in a matchbox. He would hold up a matchbox yes. <laughs> and he would say, this matchbox is conscious. It's just, and if you if you regard it with respect, it is going to, and this is not, you know, this is not something original on his part. If you even look in the Ayurvedic text, it says literally, if you behave properly with the food grains and the farm animals and the gemstones, they will behave properly with you. And if you don't, and he says this, you know, Vimalananda would say, this is just, this just is the basic hygiene when it comes to living. If you respect everything to the degree that those things are karmically going to be well aligned with you, they will be well aligned with you. And if you regard everything as being your possession and you can waste and destroy whatever you want to, that's what's going to happen in, in, in your direction. I mean, the golden rule, Jesus created the golden rule because it was a simple way of saying that whatever you do is coming back in your direction. It's not at all complicated. And, and so he was always respectful with everything, especially what he was going to eat. So, you know, he would pick up a, cauliflower and, he, and and I remember him one day saying to it, oh ma you know because everything That's was right. a mother to him mm-hmm. oh ma I'm going to cut you now and yes. so and then he chopped it up but you know I could I could feel at that moment that he was really extending his compassion to the thing appreciating that it had its own experience its own reality its own life and that life was about to be terminated but he appreciated what it was doing it was being terminated, but it was keeping his own physical body alive, and he was blessing it. And then, by virtue of doing that, then that blessing comes back to him. It's not like he was doing it for some uh, utterly altruistic motive. It was 
to be to nice to the cauliflower, but also to be nice to himself and whoever else was going to eat it. So it's just, and this is the sort of thing that is, this so, you, you know, he, he made the point that this, this kind of attitude should be so basic to life that everybody does it, and then everything would be moving in a much, in a much more uh, straightforward and, and, and easy or easier kind of, this is not an easy planet to live on, but an easier kind of matter. But, but people have, have unfortunate ideas about who they are and who, what the world is, and they create more and more complications for themselves and for everybody around them. In fact, there was one exactly this very same thing. And I was in the Bombay apartment and, um, and it was time to cook dinner. So he decided he wanted to cook, cook a dish of lal bopla or deep orange squash. A pumpkin. A pumpkin. A, Indian, a large Indian, Indian large massive orange Indian pumpkin. Pumpkin. And, um, and I, I assiduously watched him do this. He held this up, he spoke to it, he recited a few mantras to himself, whatever. And uh, he apologized, the Jai Ma, all of this. And then he made this dish and I watched very carefully everything he did. And I have never been able to replicate what he did. And I have tried that dish, which was so delicious, at least 50 times, I've never been able to get it quite the way he did. So you he think had the, it was the mantras? I don't know. He had that magic about him in that kitchen. I, mean, I've yeah, I mean, really tried. It's always hard to tell whether it was a mantra or just personal power or the fact that he had done it so many times that that it was the dish itself was was creating itself or a combination of all of the above. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to, causality. It's it's it, you know. Single factor causality doesn't exist, but and we try to, you know, try to find out what is the most important factor. When in fact, sometimes it, it there is no most important factor. In in Ayurveda, we call it yukti, bahu karana yogaja, something that is created from many different causes. Right. So when all the causes come together. And after a while, you know, if you're doing this, it's just a matter of you don't even have to make a lot of effort. You just kind of you align yourself in a certain way and, and things automatically happen. So um, uh, and, and that in itself is quite instructive. Because he had such a really fluid um, sense of nature around him, like in the kitchen that evening. Um, I think all of this, in his case, added up to a kind of elegance. There was something just deeply elegant about him, about the way he moved, about the way he spoke, about the way he performed Homa. There was just an elegance because he was so connected up in both a, in both a conceptual and a detailed way with his surroundings. I was at the racetrack with him once. I don't think Robbie was there, but uh, it was maybe it was in Pune. And um, he was dressed in his suit and all of that. And um, uh, there were sitting, we were sitting in the owner's boxes. And uh, there were all of these owners. And he would introduce me to this is Mr. Chowdhury, who manufactured five crores of rupees in his basement last week, that kind of thing. And um, this is Mr. Punawala. This is different people well-known horse people in the horse race world. And, and he was sitting there in his fine suit and I was trying to be as, since I, I didn't even have a pair of shoes. And uh, I just had my chuppels. And, uh, but, but I could see that there was a kind of an, he was greatly respected and admired and by, by all these owners whose wealth was way more than his but who were really, really the top guns at the, at the racetrack. And, but his elegance was so profound that he was very much admired and they all spoke very well about him. And it was just kind of a, a really satisfying situation to see that, yeah. There's an archaic Italian word that really 
uh, applies him. Sprezzatura. It's also a nice word to say. Sprezzatura. And it means effortless expertise. Effortless. So yeah. it, it was not, it was, he was not in any, he never wasted even a moment attempting to put on a persona. It's, he, right. It was always completely and utterly natural. Uh, in Sanskrit, we use a little bit of a longer word, sarva guna sampannata, which means in all of the qualities, there was uh, sampannata, there was like a completion or a perfection or accomplishment or something. So it was just like everything, every, all of the qualities were, were just automatically displaying themselves to their best capabilities. And he was just there delivering, you know, uh, uh, whatever was needed to be delivered at that moment. So both of you, I'm assuming, had moments where he was he would get angry at you because you said he had a temper. But did you always feel the love from him, even if he was angry at you? Well, I did at least. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, it was always there. It was always a flow of love. And and when he was angry with, I mean, sometimes you could see that he was put out by somebody, like he was with Doctor Panotra when he ran out of petrol, but. Around us, I think he was always, always, that flow was always there. Um, I wanted to talk to you all as well about Avishkara, which is in the Agora books. Were you both there at times when he was doing that at the same time? So what was your experience like, Fred? Because I think we've talked a little bit about it. Um, well, he would get himself into a state. It was often... Slightly, you know, it, it wasn't like immediate, but it would take a few minutes for him to move into uh, into a, into a condition. Was and there music, or just describe the scene a little bit for us? No, there wouldn't well, often be music. But I mean, it would depend. Certain songs, yeah, even certain Hindi songs film songs, him on, would yeah. cause him to go in a certain direction. Yeah. Sometimes wearing a particular turban in a yes. particular way. Sometimes some. Fragrance. Some you, so he had he had uh, uh, I don't know what you would call it uh, uh, methods for in in in, in to cre to foment the inception of a particular state, um, and of course uh, his his point was um, it was prudent to have some kind of control over whether you were going into a, a certain state or not, because if you went into samadhi while you were driving down the road, that might not be good. So uh, even though he was always moving from one level of reality to another, he, he, he always kept uh, alignment with this reality so that he could continue to function in this reality when he needed to. There were many times I remember him going into, as Robert mentioned here, about the um, the turban or the incense. There was a, something sensory or physical that would that would place him. It, you know, it was a sense of elegance. It was his physical beauty and so on that would that would pull him into these different states: a song, a turban, some attar or incense. And um, he could sit there looking extremely regally. He was, I mean, he was a regal persona under any circumstance, but you could even see his physical, his physical being appearance change. And it wasn't a matter of him helped hypnotizing you to believe that. Um, so it wasn't acting, that's clear. It's like no, it wasn't thing. acting, and it wasn't him just putting a, a spell on you to make you think that he was actually looking like Hanuman, or or and or certain depictions of ancient emperors, that kind of thing. But it was that he really did, in my experience, actually change his physical form a bit. But um, it was very commanding. It was very generous. Um, it was very straightforward. People would, some would often approach him when he was in such, uh, his eyes would kind of very, very much change. And um, people would ask him things. They would ask him about their daughter's marriage or about, um, 
you know, sometimes people would ask him spiritual questions of a tantric variety, like about worshiping a certain deity or something like that. And he would answer them as, you know, but it was always kind of cryptic um, because he was on his level and everybody else was on their levels. And he would say what he was going to say, but he wasn't going to compromise and come down to a certain level just because that's what they wanted. Um, but he could answer them straight away and people came for healings. And uh, that was a big thing people came for. They were suffering from something or other, and and sometimes he would he would just even in his condition he would like grab them by the armpit or something like that and grab it like a tendon and pull it really hard. Did you ever see that? Mm, yes, or it, you know he would hit somebody or yeah. some, occasionally he would kick someone. Yeah, and they'd feel better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes dramatically. Mm. Yeah, so, um, I, yeah, people would come around. That's the big thing, is that, is that spiritual figures in India are expected to be miracle workers as far as healing is concerned. And he had that power, but he was also new enough when it was, because this is the thing, is the, what Robert was mentioning about Renaud Bandana, which is, you know, karmic, debt, literally, a karmic balance, the balance of debt, and um, an abandana, um, uh, bondage. And uh, he knew who was there, whose healing would not afflict him, and whose he had to take on because of his own karmic relationship with that individual. So people would come in and they would and he wouldn't attend to them at all, and they would be bummed out and say, oh, he's nothing but a fraud because he didn't heal me, you know, as if I'm so important that I should be healed by him, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but then there were certain people whom he felt a, a stronger relationship with that he would take on, or he would help, or he would give clues, or he would get cues, or he would prescribe certain medications, well, as often as not, in fact, more often than not, he would say, you take this or that or the other, medication, the Ayurvedic or allopathic or homeopathic, whatever it was. Um, and um, uh, if he would tell them to take it, it would usually work. You know, it wasn't, I, so they didn't come into him in the last stages of cancer and say, give me a medicine. And he'll say, go home and take an aspirin. You know, he wouldn't, he would know better than to do something like that. Um, but, um, uh, you know, because he was always, always measuring out Renato Bandana. This was part of that Adidaivic perspective, you know, of, of the immediacy of a situation, the immediate spiritual, psychic, physical, divic relationship. And that was, he did that in the healing. And, uh, and sometimes he would end up taking on things that yeah. people, as, as, uh, is is not I mean uh, the, which happens to other people who are not even very spiritually advanced sometimes without their knowing it but it, it, uh, and frequently it was the case that people um, uh, could not even could not even perceive that um, that he was doing things for them. Uh, I mean, the, probably the most extreme example of this was when he actually died, there were three people present in the room, mm -hmm. me, Roshni, and a certain other um, lady. <clears throat> and just, I don't know, and this is somebody whose family that um, uh, he had been working with and helping out in various ways for the not that long, maybe a couple of years or something. And it was a couple of weeks after that that, this woman came to me in Roshni and said, oh my God, he never did anything for us and we put out so much money feeding him and paying to take him here and there. And <clears throat> Both Roshni and I, I mean, literally could not believe what we were hearing. So here's this person who had been experiencing all of this and had not been able to perceive it at all, had been present when he died, but still had been had been her her ability to perceive had been completely blocked. 
So, I mean, there were, and, and, and such were also the, I mean, there were just not, very few people could really get an idea of what was going on with him. He, he did not want people to know what was happening. When he was younger, he, he said sometimes too many people would come and then he would have to tell them that after a while he would say, oh, I'm sorry, I got involved with some woman and now I have lost all my power please go away. And they'd go away. And then after a while, more people would come. Then he'd have to come up with a new excuse somehow. So he never wanted people to come to him. They would come to him anyway. And sometimes he just sort of manipulated the situation that they would, they would think, um, uh, you know, first they were thinking, oh, I should come in his direction. Then suddenly they, actually, there's nothing here. I'm going to go somewhere else. And off they would go. I saw him get um, kind of wild on these foreigners who found him. I, I don't know how they found him in Pune. Uh, they were Rajneeshers, and they were living in the Kabristan, which is the Muslim cemetery. And um, they were looking just, I remember them coming into the room, and they were just looking terrible, unhealthy, debilitated, you know, with energy like lost and you know you could say that there was a certain kinds of people who came to Pune as Rajneesh disciples back then in the early 80s but these people were looking particularly down and out and how they even found their way there I, I got no idea but he got really wild on them and um, he, after asking where, where they lived and they told him then he said, you know, you, um, you've got to get out of there right away. Don't even spend another minute there. And, of course, they went back and spent more time there because that's where they were camping out. But um, eventually, I guess they did get scared enough to leave because, believe it or not, they found their way back to him about two months later. And I was there, and they were looking a whole lot better, and and they thanked him for telling them to leave the Kabristan. This is the thing you hang out, hang out with dangerous. A graveyard. Yeah. Graveyard it's with these with certain kinds of unfriendly spirits. And um, it could have a debilitating effect on you. You have to really, you know, be careful about that. Yeah. So, but he was, he was not anti-foreigner, obviously. No. Fred and I were there. And I have not, there's a woman I have not met, but an Australian woman who he met uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know a decade or fifteen 60s. years, and yeah, long before, and who he helped out and and gave some guidance, but um, you know, never he I guess understood that his relation with her was not such that he it was it was not the same relation that he might have had with me, for example. So, but but she has continued. I mean, she still testifies to how much he helped her out back at mm -hmm. that time. So it had nothing to do. I mean, he did, generally speaking, feel like um, it, there was a, that there tended to be a a, a a a big challenge being born in the West, and of course now I'm talking about 50 years ago. So now it's a big big challenge being born in the affluent world, and that is that you think you can buy things, and you think that uh, yeah. everything is about consumption and. That love means sex, and all, and instead of really taking a close look at reality, and that's what he always, it, uh, you know, it's it, he uh, said repeatedly, always live with reality because if you don't, you can be absolutely reality is not going to uh, pretend that everything is fine with you. Reality will come and live with you, and you're going to have to do it. Do it in advance before you have to do it. Mm. Yeah, as you were talking, it reminded me of what you were saying earlier about what you give is what you get back, you know, and so when people are in the receptive mode or they're grateful, it seems mm -hmm. like the healing comes back in their direction. Definitely. More so. And, you know, their ability to perceive this Adi Daivika, they're open if they're, you know, feeling positively towards that energy and being open towards it, it's going to come back towards them. So it's sort of like, the same kind of concept with all the healing and the, you know, being receptive to that. And I'm curious because I know a lot of your work has been around possession 
And so how, what impact did it have for you to be in these spaces with Vemalananda to tap into that Adi Daivika? Like, how did that inform your, your academic work and, and, and what you did in the world? Well, it, it really did inform it. In fact, I dedicated my book uh, to him. And um, it, uh, it made me just really aware that, that, we're, that whether we know it or not, there's always these other forces around us and it would behoove us to make friends with them to the best of our ability. And um, as Robbie was saying here is that, you know, we're, we're under the illusion that, that, that acquisitiveness is the goal of life acquisition. And, um, but stand back and breathe easy and let our senses relax into living with reality, into the reality. Reality is not just what we see in front of us. That's one thing, but we have to, we have to always be cognizant of that, of course. But there's a lot more that's there for us to be cognizant of. And that's, so he impacted my work in, in the, so when I started really doing a lot of research on and hanging out with a lot of people who are possessed and, and re, possession rituals and, and people who'd been negatively uh, possessed and had some affliction because of it, then I began to re- attune myself into that as well. Um, not to the point where I would ever dream of becoming a, a healer, nor did I have the skills. But at least I was able to um, to understand some of the mechanics of the way that different levels of our visible and nearly visible worlds could organize themselves. Do you want to share how being around Vemalananda now, thinking back, like how that impacted your... I mean, obviously, it's impacted your life a lot, but do you want to share something? Um, well, I, I think... Um, I think the thing that... Um, it's hard to come up with one thing, but I, I think the thing that comes up to me right at the moment is that... Um, He always liked to say that Tantra was the science of personality. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pe- you know, people think they have one personality, actually, they have several personalities, and none of them really, you, most people have no control over which personality is, is, is activated at any one moment. It's all, they're just being manipulated by their karmas. And so the idea is to unify your personality and to progressively transform it into another personality. And um, so by when I was around him and he was in the flesh, automatically I could feel my own personality aligning with him. And, and, and there, there, as to a certain degree, um, uh, and often, and, and is often substantial degree being influenced by his, and and since he has uh, uh, gone from being embodied to disembodied, I continue. I have continued to to number one feel his presence in my life, but sometimes uh, to to feel uh, my own self sometimes embodying his energy or his way of and and and. And having uh, to to a, a minor degree, no doubt, but it but perceptibly to have his presence acting through me in some positive way, in some in some environment in which positive action was required. So um, it, it it's been interesting to see as time has gone by, and he passed away uh, in December. It'll be forty years this year. Uh, but it's been interesting to see how uh, how the I have evolved, so it's been easier for me to act as a vehicle through which that 
his presence can have a, hopefully a beneficial uh, effect in the world. Yeah, well said, well said. You know, that's why our teachers are always acting through us. And if we try to prevent it, then we're just messing up what they're doing. We're messing up the teaching. But by welcoming that energy given to us by our teachers, it's, it's, it's a kind of a repayment, balancing out that Renato Bantana in a way. We're doing the best we can. It may not be whatever it was that, that was given to us, but we're doing what we can. And he never claimed that he was noteworthy or important or no, anything. No, never. He always said, if I know anything, it is because of my gurus and because of Maas, Mashantara. Right. It, I, I'm just acting as the vehicle for those things. So acting as a vehicle for him is acting as a vehicle for his gurus and for his deities. And those gurus were acting as a vehicle for their gurus. And I was fortunate, in fact, both uh, Fred and I were fortunate to know his um, Diksha Guru, uh, his, uh, uh, he, he had um, uh, three Gurus, and one of them, uh, Roshni met, but we did not, and, uh, uh, and one of them that in the Agora books is known as Junior Guru Maharaj, uh, we met many times. And, um, and he was a very different person from Vimalananda, but it's obvious that there was that 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 the reality of and and that previous guru of Vimalananda's was also a guru of Junior Guru Maharaj. So there was the, there was a a a, a web of uh, Renano Bandana acting at a, a totally different level that was involved in 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 facilitating certain forms of knowledge that have been transmitted from generation to generation to continue being transmitted. And what will happen now, we don't know, but at least there's the potential that some of that will be transmitted to some future generation. Yeah, and every disciple gets a different quality of, of energy and teaching. From I remember once sitting with Vimalananda in Bombay, and um, this, this sadhu comes in from the jungles dressed in black, all black, like a black dhoti, a black shirt, black uparna, uh, a uh, gamcha over his shoulder, like that, and um, looks very sort of tough and a little bit foreboding about him. And um, I asked Roshni later, who, who, who is this? And um, she said, oh, somebody that he taught to go out into the forest and perform some sadhana. So people like this that I never, you, you meet once, that were also represented him in a certain different kind of way than we did. And I don't know how many of these people were out there that I never met. You might have met more of them. No. He said there were, you know, two or three people that he, he had initiated and sent out into the forest and they were there and they were doing what they needed to do. But most people he would not send out into the forest because he said most people have Renana Bandhanas that need to be dealt with here. And he said to me more than once, you know, I would love to send you out into the forest, but you have responsibilities in this world and there's no use trying to run away from them because they will just catch up with you. So deal with them in this lifetime and, and let's see what happens next time. In the same way, I expect the Guru Maharaj um, had more many more disciples than we would ever have known about, and who would have been a, a different characters, different personalities, different sets of karmas than Vimalananda. And it, this is the beauty of the Indian spiritual traditions, is that it does change from generation to generation. That the dynamism of all of these sampradayas or, or traditions is lays in the fact that they're not replicated exactly from one generation to the next, but there's always some change going on, which is necessary because it's accounting for the thing that they don't account for in institutionalized religions, which is Renato Bandana, which is a person's exact personality 
as, as, and the dynamic between teacher and disciple. You, they can account for this within some of these traditions like this. But um, so, so they're not just hammering some kind of Procrustean bed, hammering some doctrine into a person, you know? But there's a real, this is what keeping the traditions alive. Anyway, mm. and, and well, enough I, of that lecture. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> Guru Maharaj was, Fred is one of the few people who have actually seen Guru Maharaj's certificate from the Archaeological Survey of India. And that said that this is to certify that Jathal Sadhu, Rambaswamardas, was found. It didn't say in Samadhi, it just said was found during an excavation in Kurda Road Taluka of Puri district of Arista State in the year, was it? 1904. 1904. And um, so, I mean, this is, this is something that doesn't happen so much anymore, but but we know has happened. We there there are many stories of sadhus who have been sitting for centuries in samadhi. Many people, uh, including me, believe that Nyaneshwar Maharaj is still sitting in samadhi after more than seven hundred years in Alandi. Mm -hmm. And but 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 just because he was in samadhi for two hundred years does not mean his Renanubandhanas have all gone away. He came out of Samadhi, that Guru Maharaj came, you know, was found in, in, the, in the remains of this temple that had collapsed 200 years before. Somebody was brought from Puri, brought him down out of Samadhi, and then he was back in the, back in the stream of Renanubandhana. So um, the, the, the reality of what it means to be partly in the spiritual world and partly in this world is, is, I mean, it's, it's, it's such, a per, such a particular reality that, it, 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 as Fred says, it's, you know, modern simplistic, simplified versions of spirituality just do it no, uh, the, uh, are not at all representative of what that reality actually is. I read a book uh, just a few days ago about a man known as Baba Bhagawan Das Bodhisattva, hmm. who... Um, uh, had an ashram in the like the 1960s in Matunga, which is a, sec a section of Bombay. He apparently was from the Punjab somewhere, um, or maybe Sindh, uh, West Pakistan, supposedly. He'd come and ended up in Bombay. And he was the guru of Dr. Ramamurti Mishra, hmm. later known as Brahmananda Saraswati, who founded a uh, uh, Ananda Ashram in Monroe, New York. And um, uh, one of the things at the very end of the book uh, that, uh, that Dr. Mishra, I knew him, I met him several times. He had not taken sannyas at that time. He was still call, uh, known as Dr. Mishra. And so one of the things that Dr. Mishra says at the end of this book that I think that is really, 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 it encapsulates this in a certain way is that um, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. Call it God or providence or whatever you want to. And we human beings are not. We're very particular. But what we can do that God can't do is be particular and cosmic at the same time. And that's why the universe exists, so that we can go beyond what God is capable of. Now, of course, going what beyond is God is capable of, you know, if you are able to do one good thing, there's always going to be some kind of cost for it. There's no free barbecue. So um, uh, you, when, when uh, Rama or Krishna or Parashu Rama or anybody gets born into the world, they have to deal with karmas also. They have problems that they have to deal with. But they're, but, but they're dealing with them at the same time that they are connected into the cosmic reality of something that is beyond all manifestation. So it, it's, it's the, 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 very, the very fact of being able to exist and connect to that reality on this plane is something that is in that way superior to simply being disconnected from all manifestation. And so uh, 
the the their their the 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 basis of Hindi uh, Indian spirituality for the past many thousands of years has been we have the one and we have the many, and the one and the many are relating to one another. They have a they have an ongoing relationship, and it can't possibly have started because that would imply that time existed before creation. And what will happen in the future, we don't know. But definitely what's happening right now is that this is still part of that same, that, 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 that same relationship between unity and diversity that's been happening for so long. And Vimalananda was a unique, like all of us are, but he was a uniquely unique manifestation of, this, of the drama uh, uh, and and uh, the and the the comedy, the pathos, the tragedy, the comedy, the 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 full spectrum of what it means to exist at the as Alfred Jarry used to say, God is the tangential point between zero and infinity. To to exist at that tangential point between where there is the singularity and where there is the infinitude, the uh, and, and just to be walking along that 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 um, that that tangential that 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 uh, 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 razor's edge the razor's edge, and he liked to say uh, often in Hindi, "Nizindagi ki kushi, na maut ki gum, kinare kinare chale hum," meaning I'm not connected to or attracted by the pleasures that life has to offer. I'm not dismayed by the misery of death. I'm walking along, right along the edge. And that's what he did. Yeah, he really embodied the, the, the one and the many. But to him, the, the one was, was very alive and in its own kind of embodiment. Uh, you could say smashantara, or you could say whatever you want. But the many was many more than we would think on all kinds of different levels. So he was able to kind of patch it all together and, and be kind of a channel for the one and the many. At least he was for those people who were attuned to him. Yeah. Well, thank you both for your time. With pleasure. Yes, definitely. I enjoyed it. And thank you for bringing us together for this. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya.